There's a pretty one, Ulysses. There it is. Hello, BookTube. I'm Sean Breeze Books, and this is the full version of the great bookish, uh, zany, and intellectual by turn, ranging from the lowbrow to the highbrow, or was that from the highbrow to the lowbrow? All things bookish chat with Adam of Memento Mori. The first half of this chat was featured in my mystery guest spot as part of my Friday reads on August 30th. And I didn't have room for the full chat, so this is the full version. If you don't want to watch the first part again, why wouldn't you want to watch it again? You can skip ahead to the timestamp in below here, and the timestamp is also in my show notes to so get the new material. Without further ado, here it is. And wow. I, will, I will say inappropriate things. So you know, in your editing room, oh. I won't. I won't feel bad if you cut anything out. I'll only edit out the appropriate things. <laughs> yeah. Well, boys and girls, um, this mystery guest is, needs no introduction. This is Adam of, uh, formerly of Memento Mori. Adam, I mean, formerly, I just posted a video you like two weeks actually. ago, John. One video a year that still counts for being part of the community, correct? Well, it does when you get more hits on that one video than I've gotten, from, you know, on any of my videos in the last year combined. <laughs> And I start in saying, um, thank you for having me on your channel. I'm a li So since we last talked, it's been a couple years since I've been on the channel. You have changed the name, okay? Sean the Book Maniac, um, which I do like the new name better. I think it's more classy. I think the Book Maniac was a little unhinged. I, I will say the difficulty is that I have a very twisted mind. So I want to say Sean breeds books. Okay. And it's very yes. difficult. It's breeze. Okay. I'm B R E E D S. I'm thinking. That's probably how most of us say it, unless we're really yeah. working hard at enunciating that TH. Yeah. Was that on purpose? No. I, it's be, I, I wish I had thought it through a little bit more. I could have done something with instead of breathes, I could have done breathing. It's a lot easier to pronounce, isn't it? Or breather, but just breathe is actually the the most difficult conjugation to. It's to difficult say. to say, but it, reading it, it sounds good. I mean, it, it is. Yeah, it it's does. a great title. No, it, it it is a much better title. But what what kind of prompted that change? As well, I I, I just thought it was time for a change, and uh, you know, I can't do any. I can't give myself a facelift, but I can change my name. So there you go. <laughs> a fresh start. I love it. What, did I tell you one time when my last trip to Thailand, I tried to get a, uh, this little like stuff down here removed with lasers. I went to a, 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 you know, a place where they do procedures and there was one where they inject lasers into your, um, it goes through the skin and it reshapes your jaw. And I thought, you know, put me in the machine, put me in the machine and let's, you know, just tighten it up a little bit. And these young women, they look at me and they say, um, no, that's just fat. You can't get rid of it through lasers. That's just fact. Like, I was there willing to give you my money. Put me in the machine, Sean. It was meant to be, though. Yeah. And and uh, what the hell are good are lasers for if they can't deal with fat, for Christ's sake? Yeah, yeah. Are you saying the lasers can't go through the fat to reshape my bone? <laughs> like, we're living in 2024, for Christ's sake. I hope they didn't charge you for that advice. No, they didn't. Um, my significant other was in the next room getting a procedure done. So <laughs> apparently he was not he was not too fat to get the, the, the work done. But uh, it's meant to be because it's a slippery slope, Sean. You get one thing done and suddenly, you know, you're looking like uh, what's that guy, that Republican Matt, Matt Gates? <laughs> oh, Matt Gates. <laughs> looking like a child like him. No, yeah. you don't sound like him. So how was the Re Republican National Convention for you, Adam? Oh, God. It's embarrassing. It's just it's just an absolute mess down here. It's going to be a wild uh, fall. And uh, I'm just like, you know, Trump's going to win 100%. Um, yeah, you know, I think so. Absolutely. I don't care who they prop up on the other side. And it's just, it's chaos. But at least well, like this time we're planned for it, right? Um because the world's so you're going to come back. up and live with me in Canada. That's right. Yeah. 
let Kenji know. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> hey, can I live on the farm? I, I don't know about living in, in where you live, but I'd like to go to the farm. And, and um, well, the farm how would your mother currently... feel about that? Well, as long as she doesn't watch any of your videos first, she'd probably say yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do hard labor, um, mm -hmm. but you know, maybe as the, the, if there, you know, I could do some, the cows. I don't know. Is there cows there? There's no cows there. But... I, I can churn the butter. <laughs> I don't know what they're doing on farms these days. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not going to ask how, how you learned that skill, but... <laughs> In Thailand! <laughs> Alrighty then. So, um, have you been reading anything, Adam? I have. I've, I've had an incredible year of reading, and it's been a reflection of my own mental health, and I, I wonder, you know, do you take stock in that? Because how my reading year is going, how often I'm reading, how much I'm retaining is often a reflection of just my overall, overall well-being. Um, do you find that as well? Oh, absolutely. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. So, so I've been um, in a very good mental space, everybody. Um, and it's resulted in me reading um, really good books. So, and a lot of them are really chunky. So, yeah, big books. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm hitting an average of like 290 per this so far this year, which is good. Though that means I'm reading like real books, not these little, you know, 170 page uh, translated fictions that we're working through like a conveyor belt and pretending like we're, you know, some kind of literary aficionados, right? I resemble that remark. Oh, I know. Well, you were back. Remember those golden days when you were trying to cut down your reading and not read so many books at one time? Well, I'm, I'm on that kick as well now, actually. Yes. It's what? You're doing 15? 15, 15. at a time? Sean. 15, yeah. That's obscene. See, I had to get out of that. And of course, we're all different readers and we all consume in different ways, right? Um, but to me, I I was at a point where I was feeling like a conveyor belt. And, you know, I I used to like the idea of like a big stack of books and you take one book and you read a chapter and then you put the next and then you read another. And for you, you would say that like works for you. Well, I don't know that it works. Um, it's more manageable with 15 than it was with 52. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But really, the books that I finish are the ones that I'm buddy reading, and the other ones I just pick up once every couple of weeks. So I'm not sure that that works well, but uh, it's, it's all right for now. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sticking to just one book at a time for right. sure, but I am, um, you know, for example, if I have a thick book, um, I will break it up into a good sized chunk and only read that, you know, for for a period of you know, a week or, or however long. Um, and then we read something slimmer and, and kind of work through it. So that has really improved my reading life because I've, I've just retained more. I'm feeling more um, entrenched in, in the novels and the books that I'm reading. So that's resulted in in a lot of big books, but just better reading overall for me. So it's been good. That's good to hear. Uh, for example, for example, so we're we're gonna go through this as a mystery guest. I don't know how much yes. time I have. Okay, people, I don't have free reign. I'm under the control of Sean's editing abilities. We got twenty minutes. We got twenty minutes. Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna do a little uh, past, present and future of my reading, okay? What I have been reading, what I am, and what I will be, and we're gonna run through them relatively quick, okay? Great. So a couple books, these aren't necessarily the last books I've read, um, but there are a couple notable ones that I, I did wanna mention, because they are, I'm on booktube, so I wanna talk to the kids, and you know, th this is the hot stuff that that you all are reading on here, so I'm, I'm coming down to your level to talk about. <laughs> Some of this stuff, you guys, is too obscure for you all. It's too obscure, he's, okay? He stoops <laughs> to conquer. <laughs> all right. So the, the first one, uh, I'm a bit late on the train with this guy, but uh, I finally did catch it, which is uh, Jan Foss's Septology. Okay, I finally hey. dove into it. This won the Nobel Prize for Literature a couple years ago, yeah? That's right. And uh, I've been putting re off reading it for a while just because it is, is a big guy. But it was such a wonderful reading experience. And I was a little worried because the premise is 
it is about a man in a, a, a rural, um, in Norway, in a rural town. And he is an artist, a painter, and a very successful painter. And in the next town over, there is another artist with the same name, who's also a painter, who is not successful. And one day our main protagonist goes to this town and he finds this man passed out in the snow, um, drunk, and he takes him to a nearby hospital and it kind of veers off from there. And I was a little worried with that premise because it's obviously very, you know, they're kind of parallel lives of um, this other man representing a different path of which our protagonist could have taken under different circumstances. And that sort of thing is is interesting, but I didn't know if I wanted to read, you know, 700 pages of that. Um, but I really respect Foss for keeping that idea at arm's length. And really it was this deep, intimate character study of this man, what it means to be an artist, what it means to produce art. Um, and that whole thing with the other guy uh, was really just kind of a tool that was kept at arm's length that allowed us to, to really get to know this guy. So it just was kind of one of those books that put you in a trance and um, uh, I finished it, um, you know, just feeling like I, I needed to start it all over. There's like, there's so much more within it. So are you, are you interested in Foss? I, I am. I've read one of his novellas. Oh, yeah? How that? I yeah. I have it that was, one. It was trance-like is the perfect word. Yes. Alice, at the, Alice at the Fire. And Alice is spelled A-L-I-S-S. -S, and I couldn't, I read it four years ago. I couldn't uh -huh. tell you much about what it's about anymore, but I can remember the trance of it. It was just uh -huh. a mesmerizing. It's like, it's like my face. It's the light and the dark, right? And it's just a combination of both, right? It's, that's right. Absolutely. The left hand of darkness is the right hand of light. We need good and bad in this world to survive, Sean. Do you agree or disagree? Yes, you're really balancing out my light, my spiritual <laughs> lightness, Adam. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm not, Sean, I look like I'm high. I'm sweating here. I, I don't want your people to think that I'm like, you know, tweaking out over here. It's very hot, okay, in Seattle. Okay, so can you please put this in and let everybody know that I am melting, um, but I am also going for a little bit of drama here with the light, okay? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, like I say, I know I have this effect on all my mystery guests. Okay. Oh, <laughs> please. Okay. The other book I briefly wanted to mention, which I really wanted to sell to you, if it's not all on, on your radar, is Praiseworthy by Alexis Wright. Uh, this was a huge surprise to me because I got to say, Sean, uh, first of all, Alexis Wright is an Aboriginal Australian author. She's had a, a long career. This is the first thing I've read by her. And the, the kind of pitch is not my sort of read. I'm not into... Um, what seemingly could seem like whimsical, social justice, hot topic sort of stuff, okay? And, you know, saying the, the premise of this, it very much sounds like that. Um, it's about a, a fictional Aboriginal town in Australia called Praiseworthy. Um, there is a mysterious haze that is surrounding this whole town. And within this town, we primarily follow this family uh, of four, and each of the members of the family very distinctly represent uh, a, a fraction of Aboriginal life. So you have a father who is very much in touch with the land. He's determined to save this town through the land by searching down these wild donkeys for which he wants to, to create a, a transit business with these donkeys. You have a mother who's surrounded by butterflies and moss, and she's daydreaming about saving her family and bringing them to, to China. And then you have their children, one of which is a boy who's convinced that, that all the aboriginals around him are pedophiles, and he wants to be saved by the white man. Uh, and then the other son who near the beginning of the book kind of disappears into the ocean. And, and there's a mystery of whether he killed himself or if he's still alive or or what. Um, so so that sort of stuff, that description is would give me a warning sign, okay, because it is, you know, I don't like the W word of whimsy, but there is a certain level of that. But 
this was the most singular reading experience I've had in years. The That's wonderful. Yeah, writes, uh, writing, um, lyricism, the way she chopped it up and, and structures this story. It was just, again, much different than the Foss, but something you would just get lost in the waves of this literature. And I've just, I've never quite read something like it. And it was just, it was phenomenal. Again, I'm, goosebumps. It's not even from the heat. I'm getting goosebumps thinking about it, Sean. Well, I've heard nothing but good things about it. And the fact that you yeah. also loved it to that degree, I, I'm really uh, sold on giving it yeah. a try. And I, I know you're someone that also is, you know, you know, the dreaded magical realism and whimsical and words, you know, stuff like that you, you tend to veer away from. Has that changed okay. in recent years or what do you think? I'm, I'm a little bit more moderate with it. I can, I can appreciate it when it's done well or when it hits me right. I'm not, it's not part blanche. I will not go near it yeah. type of response anymore. Yeah. If it's something that's whimsy for the sake of being whimsy, I have a difficult, you know, problem with it. But if it's done well and it, it really pluses the story, then um, I'm all for it. And, and Alexis Wright did it, and I can't wait to read her her other stuff. She has a, a, a big catalog of, of stuff. Absolutely, so. yeah. Exactly. And look, so what are you currently wait. reading, Adam? My light, yeah. And first of all, my light has now stabilized. I it has. <laughs> have a nice glow. Look at this. We've made it to the fire. The sun goes down. Oh, we made it, people. All right. So what? So what? Uh, so we talked about a little bit what I have been reading, um, or what I finished, and now I'm going to talk about what I currently am in the middle of. One really big guy and one short one. Uh, the big one. This is Marshland by Orohiko Kaga. This was uh, I'm curious just, about this one. Yes, just published by um, Dalkey Press, who does the most amazing releases. They're they're really incredible. They're always late on publishing stuff. They announce stuff and then it comes out, you know, two years later when it's supposed to. But they put out a lot of big stuff, a lot of translated stuff, and 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 really good um, unknown kind of you know digging stuff up from from the grave so they're great but this was originally published in 1985 massive 900 pages so it's a big guy oh gosh it it's so good you know a couple of those those uh books that i i just talked about and a lot of my reading this year has been i don't want to say experimental because i don't like that word there is no such thing as experimental anymore everything's been done okay but <laughs> but we'll, we'll say there may be a little um unconventional in their style and structure um and not to call this conventional by any means but it is you know this big sweeping epic with this large cast of characters it plays with with time and structure a little bit but it is more traditional in in the sense of, of the novel it takes place in the late 60s during university riots um, that were happening within tokyo and, and surrounding areas are you familiar with that? Part of modern Japanese history, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's interesting to learn about that, and it's the main protagonist is Atsuo, and he was is a veteran from World War II. So there's some kind of uh, post World War II politics thrown in there, mixed with the, these protests and, and the history revolving around that. There's stuff about ice skating. Um, there's stuff about the marshlands, which is I don't know whether it's northern or southern japan but rural areas that you know that are covered in these marshes where um you know primarily where i'm at i'm 200 pages into it primarily we're in tokyo now but um he has a nephew who who lives um in these these marshlands so it's going just in all of these different things and it is again compared to what the other things i've been reading this year much more plotty and kind of sticky and and, and just kind of a big novel you can get stuck into so um, I'm excited. Yeah, I want to. I want to ask you to talk about that adjective sticky. I mean, I don't know what you mean by that, and I'm very curious. Just like you know, you just feel, you know, a book where you can get take the time to get to know these characters and get stuck in the atmosphere and have all these different branches of areas. You know, you might not be interested in in this protest going on, but maybe you like the ice skating stuff or, or the World War II stuff, and you had this life is crime. So there's all these different areas, and I love a book that kind of gives you, which I guess is the opposite of sticky, but gives you different avenues to go down. And maybe not all of those avenues are, are your thing, but as a whole, it, it you just kind of get stuck in the novel, okay? Do you know that experience? Um, 
I do, and that really sounds like a Sean book. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Order it. Order it. The other moving on from a very big book to a very short book. This is a, a, also a new release. This is wait backwards. Flunker by Dennis Cooper, his latest release. Now, what is your opinion on Dennis Cooper? I am inter- I always enjoy hearing you talk about him. I have no desire to read him myself. Why? Um, he's just a little bit too dark for me. Yeah. Yeah, so I like to, to be refracted through your spiritual uh, light, light, lightness so that I can actually kind of... You yeah, know, well, maybe because I have such kind of a light energy around me that yeah. I need that darkness to kind of balance it out, right? We're not talking about the light outside anymore, but just, you know, I, I have such kind of a light soul that I do need these very dark, dark books to balance it out, Sean. Um, so maybe well, you're just. I, I, would, dark... I, I think you. I think you use the word adjective light, but I, I would suggest it should be lightweight. Oh, oh gosh! <laughs> I'm really concerned. Your people are going to think that I'm on something because I'm sweating. People, it's the middle of summer. These people are going to watch. The, you know, these are evergreen content in which I'm in on your channel. People are going to tune in in the winter and be like, "What's going on with this guy?" It's 82 degrees here, and nobody in Seattle has AC. Okay. Well, I, I, I don't think any, many more people are going to be wondering what's going on with you than, than normal, Adam. <laughs> Dennis Cooper, Flunker. This is, uh, again, was just published a couple weeks ago by a press called Amphetamine Sulfate, which is a really cool publisher in, in the U.S., and they publish a lot of weird, dark stuff. Uh, you know, very gritty. So it's a really big get because they're 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 very small press. So to get an author like Dennis Cooper is is quite a, a big thing for them. And it, he is, you know, this is a collection of six stories, and I'm working my way through. But it is very cool to see because he is kind of this cult author. He writes very dark queer stories. All of his stories have um young gay men going through really horrible stuff. There's body horror. Um, there's, you know, punk music He definitely has a, a certain atmosphere within all of his books. But through that, there is really a heart beat there. It's not just salacious for the sake of being gritty and dark. And that's rewarding to me because when I was young, um, I did. I just wanted to read the most disturbing stuff I could. Uh, you know, I wanted to push that button. But as I, and I as I get older... I still appreciate that side, but I want something more to chew on once you kind of get that initial adrenaline of, of the gross out, right? Um, so I, I, I've really loved aging with Cooper, and I've also loved seeing a whole new generation of readers, especially, you know, young gay men who are discovering him. And his books are, are you know, still being published and, and, and being put out there. And there's a whole new generation of Dennis Cooper fans. So this, I don't, um, I'm working my way through. It's very short, but I love So it. do you think that it, your new experience of him, is that his evolution, your evolution, or a mixture of both? Um, my evolution. Because the it's work good. was all, it, within his own work, it was always there. Um, it, absolutely. Okay. And I, I definitely think as he's aged, he certainly has put, you know, there is more of a heart and a pulse to his work. But even his older work, it's not. And and a lot of these guys, I look at, um, what's the American psycho guy? Um, <laughs> Freddie um, Sinalis. Um, you know, they're, they're, when I was young, I read that to get a quick high. And then I was done with it. And now I can read it. And I don't like him quite as much, but I can get more out of it. So I'm, I'm growing up, Sean. I'm growing up. I'm a I'm an adult. No. I've been waiting. <laughs> So uh, to continue on, Adam, uh, what else have you got for us? Okay, so I want to talk about just a few things I want to read because a, a week from Monday, I'm headed back to Thailand, Sean. You um, are. And Japan, okay. And I haven't I'm not been there. Back, I know. I haven't been back to Japan since 2019 when Sean was gracious enough to, to meet me in person, okay? <laughs> and uh, yeah, Tay and I had a, a wonderful time uh, meeting uh, Sean and Kenji in Tokyo and look at how our lives have changed. 
it's a, it's a whole different world since then in in, in many Absolutely. more ways than one right lord <laughs> Lord, Adam's grown up, and I've gotten uh, into my senior years, and oh my God, here we go! We put out the violin <laughs> to your senior years. You were in your senior years back then. What are you talking oh, about? I, I, I knew you'd make me feel better. <laughs> <laughs> your senior years. Is this what is this what happens when you go back to Canada? Do you think? Do you think it's aged you? Oh, Did you feel I more young and hip in Tokyo compared to Saskatchewan? Probably there's something in that. Probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, all my friends here are in their 80s. So. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> um, okay. So so, I, so I'm headed to Thailand a week from Monday. We'll be four weeks in Thailand and one in Japan. So I'm super excited. And one thing I hope all of us as readers... And Sean, I, I know you're not a big, you don't like vacations a lot and you're kind of against traveling to some extent. Yes. Well, I don't know if I'm against traveling, but I think I've done enough that I'm not really interested in traveling for myself much anymore. Yeah. But yeah. I, I hope you agree as a reader, you know, something that's very important to us is when we go on vacation or when we travel for a long period of time, what we read what we're going to bring to read and pack to read is something we all think about a lot, right? <laughs> like it's, it's serious. Absolutely. Business. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's an interesting combination. So I wanted to just run through a few books that I'm packing for trip. Um, the first though, what well, is yet to be determined because one of my traditions is I love to go into an airport bookstore or, you know, wherever they sell books and to buy, you know, pay full price and just dig through the bare minimums. And it's my time to kind of lower myself to the masses and read some commercial fiction. And, you know, this is the time where the Barbara King solvers and the Tommy Oranges and oh, the- Oh, don't, uh, don't stoop as low as Barbara <laughs> King solver. Oh, no. <laughs> Demon Copperhead. It could be. I don't know what the bookstore will deliver. It might be Demon Copperhead. What if it is, Sean? Well, good luck with that. You know, but but this is my, you know, this is it because I like the idea of a. There's something romantic about buying something, you know, a book at an airport and and having that, and it is a nice opportunity for me to kind of go to the bottom of the barrel and see what the rest of you are reading. Okay. <laughs> Uh, and and uh, let the gods guide me where they will in terms of uh, you know what what I'm going to read. So we'll we'll see what I, I find. I'll, I'll report back on uh, what commercial fiction I end up digging. I'm going to give you a challenge. I want you to vlog it, vlog that little airport bookstore visit, okay. and I'll include the vlog in this video. How's okay. that? Okay, we'll pop it in. I will absolutely do that. The, the... Okay, <laughs> everybody. Check out now what I ended up That's finding. Right. Future Adam here. Uh, and here is the results, people. This is the basic bitch book buy for my trip uh, in Seattle. I purchased the German novel um, Kairos by Jenny Erpenbeck. I hope I said that right, as I don't have the book in front of me right now. Um, it's important, Sean and audience, um, that you all know that I'm telling you the truth when I say I had no prior knowledge when purchasing this novel that it was involved in, let alone won, the International Booker Prize. Um, you know I don't support that pyramid scheme. It's disappointing to find out, but nevertheless, um, it is the reality. And I must say, I, I read the, the book um, and it was quite good. So yes, Kairos, me lowering myself down to the everyday reader. All right. Other other than that, though, of course, I always like to pack, you know, some uh, some Thai literature and some Japanese literature, depending on the country I'm going to. So for, on the Thai end, I'm bringing, I think you read this one, which is uh, Sightseeing. I did, and I very much enjoyed it. Did you really like it? Collection of stories. I'll butcher this name, but it's Radawut. Lap trap sap, um, something like that, and yeah, you liked this. I did very much. Yeah. Do you remember I anything about it, Sean? Not, not really now. But um, <laughs> they, I remember that the uh, short stories they weren't interlinked, so I'm going to be very embarrassed if they 
are in fact linked short stories, uh -huh. but I don't think they were linked. But they were just from a variety of different characters in modern Thailand. And I just thought that the stories themselves, I'm really fussy about my short yeah. stories. And they measured up. They really did. Yeah. Well, it's all, you know, Thai literature in translation is is not the easiest stuff to come by. So there's not yeah. a lot out there. So you hope the yeah. stuff that does make it through, it better be good, right? That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> And this is also another collection. I kind of like the idea of these short stories, these Thai stories. This is The Sad Part Was. Have you read this? No. Who's the author? The author is another Thai author. It's Moi Pupasakul, I want to say. Oh, I recognize the publisher by the cover design. I can't think of what that publisher's name is, but. Yeah, I, I don't see the is it Tilted one story. Or... Tilted, Tilted Axis. Axis. Yeah, and I got this a, a couple years ago, and I have, I have this stack of this Thai collection, so I know nothing about this or what it's about. It doesn't even have a blurb, really, but yeah, some Thai short stories. And then the one other on the Thai bit is these these are really trashy, not written by Thai. It's written by a British dude. It's a, it's a Thai series. Don't cringe, because it is, you know, a detective series, but it's um, The Godfather of Kathmandu, by John Burdett. And it's tradition, everybody, that when I go to Thailand, I read these stupid, stupid books. Okay. And this will be my fifth trip. This is fourth in the series. So I must have started at one year in. But every time I go, I read one of these and they're, they take Thailand and the stereotypes that people have about it in terms of Bangkok being this, you know, drug laden sex you know, world of, of madness and the heat and, and all of that. It definitely plays into that, but it's goofy and fun. And um, again, when I, I want something lighter, like a beach read, a beach read, Sean, John Burdett, he delivers with, with these. So that's the Thai side. Okay. So you've got a, what did you call it? A, a bitch, bitch read and a beach read. Bitch read. Oh yeah. My airport bitch read and my base. Yeah. My uh, beach read with the, the John Burdett. I'm all about highbrow and lowbrow when I'm on vacation, okay? I want a little something I can chew on and a little something I can just kind of uh, eat and, uh, you know, shit out. <laughs> I don't know, Sean. Okay. So, so is your next category a butch read? Well, that depends on how you view this guy. Um, <laughs> this, so if you, I don't know if you remember my last trip, 2019, when I was in Japan, I did, made my way through the uh, five works by Yasunari Kawabata, okay? Do you remember that? We talked about uh, that uh, briefly. I'll have Sean link that video twice um, down below. And, <laughs> and uh, I read five short Kawabatas through my last trip through Thai and Japan. So I thought, oh, and P.S., I don't want to dive into it because, you know, but um, there was a new Kawabata translation that was just published recently called The Rainbow. And I just want to urge your viewers to pick it up. It's so good. New Kawabata translated for the first time. It's called The Rainbow. So good. But we won't go into that for the sake of time. But for this trip, I thought I'd do with Mishima. Okay? Yukio Mishima. Well, Butch, Butch kind of fits. Yeah, it's yeah. ironically or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I don't know. He, he, he sure was, worked you know, hard on uh, trying to be. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Didn't end well, but I mean, but it is kind of a butch way to go. Yeah. Maybe we should do that. What's it called? What's the... Um... Sep seppuku? 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 Is that yeah, it? Should you go uh, out like that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, you go, we'll put you that go first. Okay. <laughs> you hold this one. It's like the Romeo and Juliet, huh? Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. But I thought, um, again, five short novels. So the only Mishima I've ever read was Confessions of a Mask. And I read it like eight or nine years ago. So it's been a long time. Um, and I never really dove past this within his work. So I thought this time around, it was Kawabata last time, Mishima this time. So I have Confessions of a Mask. I have The Frolic of the Beast. I have The Sailor Who Fell from Grace from the Sea, which is annoying that it's not the same cover. But, you know, what are you going to do? Death in Midsummer, which can be the title of this video, actually. <laughs> Absolutely. Somebody's going to die before it's over. <laughs> and Life for Sale is, is the final one. So your opinions on Mishima? What's the mask? Confessions of a Mask? Is that the yeah, title? Yeah, yeah. It kind of left me cold, so I never bothered to read any more by him. I didn't really care for it. I mean, it didn't hate it. It just mm, yeah. didn't connect with it. 
Yeah, so, I know. I mean, it's been so long since I've read it. I don't necessarily remember mine, but obviously I didn't run to the rest of his stuff. Yeah. I know I should give somebody else he's written a, a try, but I haven't, I'm not in any hurry to do so. But I'm also not a Kawabata fan. I know, Sean. Well, well, will you just give the rainbow a chance? Look at that cover. Look at that cover. Just give, just give him one more shot, Sean. Okay, I, I commit to trying that within the next year. How's that? That particular oh, one. These lists, you put it on, and you you never get to them. You never <laughs> get to them. What you just you just well, I just watched a video where you said you DNF'd a book and you're going to pick it up again in twenty years. That's right. Oh, so uh, you know, well, it's so dramatic, people. He's so dramatic. <laughs> I'm a, I, I can't handle it now, but maybe in 20 years. Dramatic Baylor. <laughs> oh, God. How many unread books you got? You don't have time for this. Pitch it. Burn it. I I have a... The proportion of read to unread is definitely coming close to 50-50, but I have no idea. I have no idea. I read The the Love of a Singular Man. I quite liked it. I don't remember anything about it, but... Oh, I you did? It. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, I thought the writing was really good, but you know, I just have my own little hang-ups about some of the themes that were there, yeah. and I made a hasty, overly hasty decision. So. Yeah. Unless we're falling on our own swords, we're not interested in death. Okay. That's right. That's <laughs> right. <laughs> That's all I got, Sean. That's wonderful. Well, uh, now that Kawabata has been introduced into the conversation, I'm going to take this opportunity to trot out my. A uh, two or three line uh, bail review from Goodreads. Let me pull it up here. Oh my God, here we go. One of my better ones. You guys, he's one of the, just a, a, ooh, just a crystal clear, beautiful writer, the best Japanese writer. What was oh, your- Wait review? a minute, I, I, didn't, I didn't bail on it. I, I just didn't like it. Well, I Sean, it was it, 72 I... pages for Christ's sake. Of course you didn't bail on it. Well, I probably, I think I- This was I had. Snow Country, correct? Snow Country. That's right. So here, here's gorgeous what I wrote. Snow. Gorgeous. gorgeous. Uh, uh, this is this is what I thought. A meek married man cares about no one, just the moon, snow, and maybe moths. And supposedly, but dilettantish, dilettantishly, that's an unfortunate word. And supposedly, but dilettantishly, ballet. Yet he does his best to inflict his gray, dull self on a ditzy drunkard hooker and one other woman at a winter resort. Misogynist. How they, how they stayed awake in his leaden, obnoxious presence, I'll never know. I barely Sean, could. You just I described barely could. every Japanese novel of the frickin' 20th century, for Christ's sake. Okay, these men, first of all, <laughs> every country, man, you know, I'm not this, like, man-bashing person uh, that Sean is, okay? Uh, but I will acknowledge that men have deep-seated issues uh, particularly as it pertains with women in every single country on this planet. And certainly America is one of them. But I got to say, Japan, the psyche of the average Japanese man is batshit crazy. The stuff that's going on there. And these oh, these guys, these Kawabatis and these Abes and these Mishimas and these uh, Mirakamis are proof of it. I mean, these guys are... And their relationship and their outlook on how they view women are crazy, but they are fantastic writers. Oh my god! <laughs> I, I beg to differ, but that's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> and that is co-signed by Sean and I, and that's it. Well, but I'd actually want to bring back the Japanese novel that you're reading, and and because it's so different, like I can't think of another really chunky Japanese novel. That, um, that that is the thing. Like we do associate uh, the. Uh, yeah. I mean, other than Mirakami, right? He's got some. Mirakami, stuff. and he's kind of in a different category. But yeah, yeah. he's. He, he, but yeah, he yeah, him. and that was a, another kind of different thing. But within it, there is an older man with a much younger woman, and they're ice skating together, Sean. And there's some messed up stuff. So we do have the Japanese, uh, you know, go to the there. hentai, the hentai stuff in there. Again, um, if you're not into the woman bashing. Maybe you're into the war, you know? There's something for everybody. <laughs> Woman bashers and war aficionados alike. We can come together. Let me see if I can quickly find it. I read a really interesting Japanese novel that you might like because it was set kind of in that same era. Um, I can't remember. how. I don't know how. I'll describe it to you, and then when I do the video, I'll put the cover gif up.
can't remember the title of the author right now, but it's about a draft dodger from the World War II, Japanese draft dodger, mm-hmm. who goes on the run throughout the war to evade the draft, and then comes out of hiding after the war, and he's a got a, a university administrative job in the post-World War II era, and as the student protests start, people had kind of accepted that he had been a draft dodger, but this, as the political climate in Japan changed, they began to change how they felt about him, and that's mm-hmm. what the story's about. It was really fascinating. Interesting. So you like that book, but yet... Yes. Can we go down this? You are a hater on the term historical fiction, Sean. Oh, uh, well, I oh, absolutely. Oh. Yeah. I just don't think it exists, or I'm not interested in it. If a book is well told, it doesn't matter what era it's set in. It's Correct. either literary fiction or it's not. So historical fiction is a is a type of genre fiction, and I don't have any. Oh my play, god, we, we, we don't want to go down that rabbit hole because it's going to go to a dark place. And I want to end on a high level, but I... Uh, We're not know. in a dark place right now. I thought we started work really <laughs> down. <laughs> I don't want to take it to Dennis Cooper levels of dark. And that's where I'll go if we get on the topic of genre fiction. I disagree strongly. Well, lots of people do. So, and I mean, my definition of literary fiction is if I like it, it's literary fiction. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, yes. Well, you cha- you've cha- you know you you used to not like children's literature, and over time you've changed. There's been things we've moved, so you know there's oh, still absolutely. Time. I used to have allergies to ghosts in my fiction, and that doesn't bother me if it's either well okay. done or not well done. But I don't have an allergy towards it anymore. So no, but yeah, I don't. I think historical fiction. That's a genre that I. Hillary Mantel is, is that historical fiction? Oh, oh God, it's remember, literary remember fiction. When, uh, Remember when the the prizes were happening and and she was in all those prizes and, and all the gay guys on here were pretending that they were suddenly into Hillary Mantel, so they were forcing themselves to listen to this shit on audio so they could catch up. None of those people liked those books, Sean. Well, I don't know about that. I don't think I would oh. sign, sign on to that uh, critique. But actually, the the audios of those books were wonderful. But I didn't only do them on audio. <laughs> I had the book open. But, uh, uh, oh, you read them too. You were one of those gays. Oh, shit. I was. I was. Now I'm not gay anymore, Adam. <laughs> Thank God. <laughs> Thank God, bro, because, you know, <laughs> we're over that. We're over that. Uh, do we have anything else we'd like to talk about? Because we, we, we can take as much time as we want, but maybe is that is that good? I, I think that's sufficient. We've gone over it. Life's good. Reading's good. I'm not this time going to uh, say that I'm coming back because God knows I never follow through with that. But so the fact that you're not up. saying it means you probably will. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's I, I still think about the community and I still am obviously close to a lot of people such as yourself within it. So, um, yeah. you know, I'm I, I'm there in the foreground, even though I'm bad. I refuse to comment on people's videos if I myself am not participating in the fun. So I apologize for not being active within your comment fields, but I am a, a patron. You are, which I very much appreciate. Yeah, I haven't received my bookmark yet. I um... haven't received your freaking address, Adam. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I don't want to give that out. So we'll figure something out. <laughs> I'll have to come up. I'll, I'll when I come up there, uh, when Kenji is settled in, and and uh, Tay and I will I'll make our pilgrimage up, and you know I'll get the lay of the land of the farm and see what I can do, connect with mom, see how our rapport is. I don't know if she'll like me or not. We'll see. Well, she probably Most, she probably won't. She probably <laughs> put me to work. Uh, we'll, we'll, in we'll, the we'll, meantime, we'll... I'll send you an e e bookmark. Oh God, no. I don't do audio books. I don't do ebooks, and I don't do ebook marks. Okay, Sean, I'll take you know. Come on. Well, you're really old school, except for all the ways in which you're avant garde. <laughs> yeah, like my reading tape. Well, on that happy note, where highbrow and lowbrow meets, and oh, in fact, I used to be unibrow until I started plucking. I had one bushy eyebrow that went straight across. Oh, insert a picture here, Sean. Yeah, in my. Uh... <laughs> Until I was in my mid twenties, where I started plucking, so my nickname was Brow. Oh God, I love I love a good unibrow. It's sexy. You should have kept it. Well, I should have kept my hair too. So yeah, we could go to Thailand, get that little unibrow transplanted on top. They can do anything except remove this fucking fat. <laughs> 
you don't have any fat. You're just uh, <laughs> fat in your head, fat in your brain, maybe. Oh, God. Adam, it's been a delight as always. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sean. Thanks for having me. Thank you.